and welcome to UK Space Day. My name is Abby and this is Steve. If you have any problems throughout the day or any questions, just come and find us and we'll be happy to help you. We've got some exciting speakers today, but first we've just got a few safety announcements that we need to go through. The fire exits are to your left and to your right, and once you're outside, they're in front of you, and to your left and your right again. The reconvening point is in the car park, so if there is any problems, we'll just meet there. The day's been broken up into four different sections. We've got a panel and some lunch and some breaks for you, and the full program is in the agenda, a full agenda is in the program, so if you haven't got that, that's on the welcome desk outside. Our first speaker today will be Steve, who's just going to give you a quick overview of what Cran said to do. So, welcome Steve. A wee bit sneaky and stuck myself here on 10 minutes. Just give us an overview of what Cran says kind of is. Um, I'm glad you all managed to find Cranfield, by the way. I know it's a bit of the middle of nowhere. Um, I, know, I know I feel it like stings for students here, especially on campus. There's not exactly much to do here. I mean, one of my theories is why Cranfield is such high prestigious. Um, like there's so much, there's not much to do here except for study, which is why <laughs> we kind of good at what we do. Um, so to give us kind of a brief overview of what kind of Francis kind of does, this is us. Um, but we have about 15 members this year, so if I'm not mistaken, and I'm sure so Cranston says alumni will give me a kick in the butt if I say that, we're one of the largest amount of members we've had here at Cranston. Um, so this is kind of what we do. Um, we typically enter some competitions, some space competitions. Uh, we've got, we've entered four this year, which I'll go over in a bit. Um, uh, we attend events, host events such as today. Um, and we try to be social. I mean, it's a very intensive course. So uh, I think most of us would say that um, we don't really get out much. <laughs> uh, but we, we have had like uh, Christmas, Christmas parties and we're doing a probably an end, <coughs> end of year sort of social event. Um, so some of the events you may have seen us at, uh, we have reinventing space or, or careers launch, you may have seen us there. We've been at Space Up Leicester, uh, Mars Society UK relaunch, um, and some of the future events we're kind of looking at doing, we've got quite a good um, relationship with Sky Aurora. Uh, so we're going to be doing a company visit whilst we attend the National Student Space Conference. Um, we're also going to a Skyro engine test fire, which will be pretty, pretty cool because we need to organise that. We've got guest lectures and, and career talks throughout the year as well. I know we've got Libby Jackson coming at some point later this year, which will be really cool. Uh, and we'll be attending some of the London Space Network. So here's some of the projects that we're kind of involved in at the moment. I won't go too much into detail about our sound one because we've got a presentation coming up from our lead systems engineer on that uh, in just two minutes. Um, but out of all these, we've got 15 members in each of these teams. So 15 members in each of the Mars Rover teams. This is a UK SEDS run competition. Um, and ultimately what that is, is to collect a sample, is to build uh, a rover that collects samples. Uh, and these are the two teams. So we've got Claw, and then we've got Furiosity, which I'm personally involved in there. Um, and then we've got Zig at the end, which is our sound rocket competition, which I'll let my colleague Daniel take over in just a sec. Um, so that's just a quick brief overview of what we kind of do. You can follow us on social media, we advise it, we do some cool stuff. Um, and if you want to use the hashtag UK Space Day today to get this event out, please do. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass over to Daniel, who will give us a presentation on the IRX and the competition. Thanks, Steve. <coughs> We're reaching that critical kind of point right now where the snow isn't pleasant so more, it's actually just a nasty ice, so uh, hopefully that will melt soon. Anyway, uh, morning everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Ziggy project. Uh, I want to start off actually by telling a bit of a story. So, um, oh, this click is going a bit too fast. Uh, think back to the 1930s. Uh, this is a time when people were launching rockets, mainly not towards space, but more like at each other. Uh, this was a time when people were skeptical about using the use of space. They were uh, laughing at people like Goddard, you know, weird time. 
but it's not God I don't want to talk about, actually. It's this guy, Frank Molina. Now, Frank Molina was a young aerodynamicist student at university, and he was kind of skeptical about the doubt. So what he did, he gathered some of his friends, a machinist and a self-taught chemist, and they went and built this rocket motor here. You can kind of see the oxygen line snaking up into the grass there. This is one of their early tests in 1936, but this wasn't their first. Their first one uh, was actually at their dorm rooms. Now that went just about as well as you might expect. Um, yeah, after the initial explosion and the disciplinary hearing, uh, they were kicked off of campus and uh, for a lot of people that might just be the end of the story, but these guys were determined. They actually went and looked, uh, looked at their mistakes, looked at their failures, licked their wounds. Oh no, no actual wounds, no one got hurt in the explosions, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, but they, they took those lessons and they went off to the desert, as I said, and continued testing. Now I find, well, after this point they actually developed so much success that a few years later they were afforded their own lab and an official title. Today they're known as NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, so I find this story to be quite inspirational actually, just because, not, not because it's successful, it doesn't end in, it's, it doesn't end in success, or because it's about rockets, but actually because uh, it demonstrates the power of learning by doing, practical learning, learning that interface between theory and actually building something with your own hands. And uh, as well as that, it's the power of learning from failure. Now, I feel like this is something that we don't do enough of. We need to do more of this sort of thing because there's important lessons to be learning from that. I can guarantee that these guys <coughs> knew their craft far more intimately uh, than anyone who would have just did what they did by studying it in a textbook. Uh, I want to ask uh, the audience a real quick question. Hands, stick your hands up if you've ever heard the phrase, we need more engineers in this country. <laughs> Um, a lot of the time when I hear students applying for jobs and inevitably getting rejected for a few of these engineering jobs, uh, they say, you know, what happened to all of these jobs that we were hearing about? Uh, and my answer, what the way I see it, is that because these are engineering jobs, we're not engineers yet. We haven't engineered anything. That's the key thing. We haven't built something with our own hands. And that is something I think we need to improve on. Uh, so, I'm going to back this up. Uh, I want to share another name with you. This is Peter Beck. Uh, you might know him as the CEO of Rocket Lab uh, down in New Zealand. Uh, now, Rocket Lab is actually quite an interesting company because they are democratizing access to space in some unprecedented ways. Uh, and they've got the ability and ambition to do it. It's brilliant. It's a really brilliant company. Um, but I want to talk more about the man himself. Now, Beck. Uh, is a little bit different to all of these other CEOs you see of, in other companies like SpaceX, uh, you know, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson. These guys are all billion, bazillionaires or something, right? He wasn't. Uh, he started off, you might, well, he started off in his dad's garage, and this is something that you hear all the time, Silicon Valley type story, right? Uh, when in actuality, innovation isn't limited to the valley, it's actually in our industry. We just need to see that it's there. We need to embrace those stories. And you can actually see he was, he didn't start off with this big rocket, he was starting off with these tiny little ones. But in his garage, he was actually doing something a little bit nuttier. Uh, this is a steam propelled <laughs> rocket bike. <laughs> yeah, it's just as nuts as it sounds. This thing was so powerful and so fast that he would actually have to sit up on the bike, stick his arms out, and probably his legs as well, just to create enough drag so that way he could slow down and apply the brakes and so that they wouldn't stick together and flip him off. He'd probably die or something, right? He had a jetpack project or something on roller skates as well. It was <coughs> absolutely nuts. You think mad inventor, you think this guy. Um, but I'm quite glad that he is still alive today because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to pass on some really interesting wisdom that I found quite inspirational. Someone asked him a few years ago, what uh, is the best way for me to stand out on an internship application? Uh, and he said, to pursue projects that show your skill and your passion. So that's what we set out to do. Uh, we have entered a competition called the Inter Intercollegiate Rocket Engineering Competition. It's run by the Experimental Rocket Sound so Experimental Sounding Rocket Association. Before I bore you to death with any more acronyms, I think it's probably better if I just show you a video to explain what I'm talking about.
reaction to that was, wow, what a poor name choice. I, I mean, anytime I talk to anyone about that, they're going to think I'm talking about breaking something. <laughs> anyway, but you can see on their faces, these people, they're watching their rockets go up. And for us, that's a really visceral experience. You can see those rockets, like those explosions, especially, like, you know, visceral experience, probably not the positive kind. But that's, that's really driving. Like that idea of building something that's so powerful and it flies off into the sky so fast, and the thought that you built it. That's what's really, that's a really huge motivator, and that's something that I feel like it'll drive me and my team, not just throughout this project, but throughout the whole of our careers. It's uh, pretty powerful. But everyone's gonna start, oops. Where'd you guys get this thing? It's, uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> obviously, uh, this is a competition all about doing, and Builders of the Saturn V rocket didn't start off with uh, building a Saturn V, obviously. They started on a small scale, and they worked their way up. Uh, obviously, this is a little bit more impressive than, say, this. Uh, <laughs> So, I've talked about what we're doing. Now, I want to talk about who we are. Uh, this is our team. This, despite what uh, this picture might have you believe, there's actually 20 of us, but organizing uh, 20 engineers on different courses on a nice day in Britain. Now, that's the real challenge. Like, <laughs> screw engineering, that's, that's easy next to this. Anyway. Um, but yeah, we've got a really nice mix of uh, international backgrounds here, uh, and we're actually pretty good, uh, well off for it. Now, uh, now I want to talk to you about the rocket that we're proposing uh, as well. So we called our project Ziggy because everyone needs a mascot, um, and this is our proposed rocket uh, for the IR competition. It's a nearly two and a half meter long rocket with a 15 centimeter diameter. This is to accommodate a standard 3U payload and uh, you've got a low static margin to try and uh, come up with as uh, 
vertical in ascent as possible, all powered by a Pro 98 series Cesaroni motor. Um, we thought, again, with the, as with the example of the Saturn V or Peter Beck or any of these other uh, good inspirations, we don't want to start off by building the final thing because that would be a huge experimental mis uh, expensive mistake. Imagine turning up to the launch pad with this thing that you spent so much money on and it blows up. Uh, so that's why we want to start off on a smaller scale. Uh, this allows us to do prototyping of uh, ideas that we have. Uh, it allows us to develop our skills, practical skills, and it develop, allows us to gather data, uh, which we can then go on to apply to our models, compare to our models, and develop uh, these error margins, see where we're going wrong, and we can develop, as we get bigger and bigger rockets, we can uh, see these error margins increase so that when we get to the final thing, we've got a good idea of how accurate our predictions are. Um, the good thing about this scale of rocket that we're proposing, actually, is that we can enter another competition right here in the UK for it. Now, this is the National Rocketry uh, Championship, and uh, this university actually has a pretty good legacy with this competition, and uh, we won it two years ago. I say we, uh, I'm taking credit for a past translate's success here, but never mind about that. Uh, this rocket, uh, they called it Rocket McRocketry Place, or something, uh, and quick video. I feel like this is a common theme with these sorts of videos. It's a very tiny little thing in the background. Just <laughs> can't see anything. But yeah, that went to about 800, 8,500 meters, I think, uh, which is pretty impressive. And as I said, they won. So a good basis to build from. Uh, that's not the only rocket that we've got lying around. You might have seen in the lobby this one. Uh, now, this is an appeal for information here because nobody seems to know where this came from, who built it, I have <laughs> no idea. If you know, please tell me because I'd love to... Oh, we know. Oh, brilliant. Okay, I'm going to be talking to you later then. Brilliant. Uh, uh, right, so that's a lot about what the university has done before, but what about our team? What have we done before? I'll tell you. Uh, I said before that we had a pretty international team, and uh, it shows in our experience. Uh, uh, so yeah, we've got we've had competitions in India, France, uh, research projects in Spain, and here in Britain. Um, actually, with this project here, one of our members would be the first student, uh, I'm told, to develop thrust vectoring for a university project for a hybrid rocket, something along those lines. It was it was the first. Um, Someone can uh, correct me on that later, but uh, yeah. So we've got loads of other experience in the team as well. Um, and sadly, this guy isn't actually on our team, but he's uh, a very good uh, other example of practice put into uh, success. Um, so he's actually a guy I went to school with, and we took on a lot of projects together uh, involving like quadcopter design, and we did actually a a hot tub build actually at one point with industrial grade fiberglass that was so watertight uh, we didn't get around to doing the plumbing or the drainage or anything so it developed a ecology after gathering a load of rainwater uh, which was a bit of a problem because it was kind of disgusting anyway I lost a good pair of trainers to that project because who knew industrial grade uh, fiberglass binder actually dissolved the soles of the plastic shoes <laughs> yeah I miss those shoes anyway uh, so as a result of his success, his experience of just tinkering around, he was able to get himself an electrical engineering job uh, measuring space weather in the Antarctica. This is him, this is where he is right now. And uh, I can't wait for him to get back, because I miss him. Uh, anyway, uh, that's, I've got two more things I want to talk about before I finish. And those are our STEM outreach, first of all. Uh, we've got this payload on board. The competition indicates that we have to have at least a four kilogram payload. And we thought, what better way to use this than to help pass on some of our inspiration, some of our motivation to uh, be practical. So we thought, we're going to reach out to some schools. We're in contact with some local schools. And we're hoping to get some secondary school and sixth form college students to uh, develop payloads that they'd like to see go to 10,000 feet. Because if you imagine, if you're in school and you have this opportunity, someone says to you, do you want to build something that is going to go to that high? I'd be, in, I'd be amazed, I'd be really happy about that. But uh, we're hoping that it inspires the same sort of 
uh, passion that we found for this project. Uh, if you're interested or if you've got experience in STEM outreach, actually, we'd love to talk to you. Come by our stand later and um, uh, <coughs> if you've got any advice, please share. Uh, final thing, uh, I want to talk about creativity. Now, this is sometimes a bit of a strange word to hear in this industry because uh, often it feels like, well not often, but sometimes it feels like an engineer can get into a certain role and lead their life somewhere else. But that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's part of an efficient system. But I believe any, every human has this innate desire to create. And so I believe one of the best ways to do that uh, is actually to get involved with an engineering society at university. And I feel like it, it's, it's one of the best ways to do this because what you get out of that is real relevant experience, uh, but you've also got passion because you choose the projects that you want to work on because you're driven by what you want to achieve. You're applying this real knowledge to your own projects. And the other thing is that you have control. You're the one in control of what you want to do. And that's what we're doing here with the Ziggy project. Uh, as a result, we've got more drive than something that we would have been just told to do. Uh, these are the sorts of projects that <coughs> Melina took on, that Beck took on, like any of these people. And these sort of small starting projects, they might be, s they're no great leap for mankind, but for us they're huge. Thank you. <coughs>